Hello everyone. Welcome to Quest Online University, a global platform for all your education and growth related needs. Today we are going to start with the very basics of organic chemistry. So the topic that we are going to continue for the next few lectures is organic chemistry and some basic principles and techniques. So in this particular lecture, we will be talking about an introduction to organic chemistry. Before we begin, a piece of information for you, you can use the coupon codes Mission J or Mission NEET while you enroll at First Online University for Mission J or NEET. Let's start with the introduction of organic chemistry. So before we actually dwell into what is organic chemistry, and what are the vast variety of stuff that we get in organic chemistry, it is important for us to know the meaning of the word organic. So what do we mean when I say organic? Organic in simple terms is life. Now you will say where does this word contain life or how does this word actually imply life? Whenever we talk about our body, whenever we talk about any living organism and the chemical reactions going on in that organism, we always talk about organic chemistry. And therefore, we can relate life directly to organic chemistry. The organic compounds are also derived from living organisms. Now, Organic chemistry is basically the study of compounds that are extracted from living organisms. So what are the various organic compounds? Organic compounds are those that contain carbon. Carbon is capable of showing catenation that you must have studied in your class 10th while you were talking about or while you were uh, studying uh, carbon and its compounds chapter. We have studied there that carbon shows this property of catenation that is the ability of carbon atoms to join together with each other and form long chains. Organic chemistry is nothing but carbon chemistry. Let us look at an introduction to organic chemistry now. When I talk of molecules like methane, or glucose C6H12O6, ethanol C2H5OH, carbon dioxide CO2, carbon monoxide CO, sodium carbonate Na2CO3, sodium hydrogen carbonate NaHCO3, or ammonium cyanate, oxocyanate, that is NH4CNO. All these compounds are categorized into one particular category, whereas there are rest of the compounds like NaCl, HCl, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, sodium hydroxide. All these compounds that contain carbon are classified into organic compounds and the rest of the compounds are inorganic compounds. So carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, metal carbonates, bicarbonates, cyanates, all of these are inorganic compounds although they contain carbon. Why? Because these compounds do not follow the properties of organic compounds. So although we said that as previously mentioned in the last slide, we said that all these Carbon containing compounds can be classified as organic compounds, but that's not true. Why? Because although they contain carbon, but they do not follow the properties of organic compounds. When I then talk about, say, the differences between organic compounds and inorganic compounds, let us see what this has in store for us. Organic compounds are extracted from living organisms, for example, sugar, that is nothing but glucose, C6H12O6. Sugar also has the formula of C12H22O11. 
that is your sucrose. Urea, NH2CONH2, is also an organic compound. On the other hand, when I talk about inorganic compounds, it is nothing but the study of non-living organisms such as rocks, minerals. So you can see the difference. Although this inorganic compounds are also something that is naturally derived, but not from living organisms. Similarly, we can also find out the chain of scientists who actually came up with all these different organic compounds that actually led to the birth of organic chemistry. In 1885, Berzelius was the scientist who proposed that a vital force was responsible for the formation of organic compounds and that they could not be actually, you know, naturally formed. In 1828, Wohler, scientist, he synthesized the first organic compound, urea, from an inorganic compound. So basically, this could be an MCQ question, like, which is fact-based, that which was the first organic compound that was synthesized, and that is urea. So from an inorganic compound, he synthesized this organic compound. So NH4CNO, which is ammonium cyanate, is an inorganic compound, which on heating got converted to urea, NH2CONH2, which is an organic compound. So the vital force theory of the last scientist was disapproved by Wohler. The last scientist that we were talking about, he actually proposed that there was a vital force that was required for the formation of organic compounds, but Wohler proved him wrong by synthesizing an organic compound by simply heating an inorganic compound. In 1845, then came the scientist Colway, who actually synthesized acetic acid from its elements. So acetic acid is CH3COOH, right? So he synthesized from these elements only. Then in 1856, Berthlot was the scientist who synthesized methane gas. Now this was the history of how organic chemistry actually developed or you know came into picture because of the synthesis of certain organic compounds or of certain compounds that could be classified as organic compounds. Now what is the importance of organic chemistry in our daily lives or in general? The importance of organic chemistry lies in the fact that organic compounds can be used in number one pharmaceutical industries that is in the form of medicines number two in petroleum industries oil fuel petroleum jelly lpg kerosene etc the third is the dye industry where we have indigo, azo dyes, etc. Fourth is polymer industry, where we have nylon, terylene, etc. Fifth, plastic industries, where we have polythenes, that is plastic bags, bottles, etc. Then we have cosmetic industries, perfumes, creams, talcum powders, all these contain organic compounds apart from the inorganic compounds definitely food industries carbohydrates fats proteins sweetening agents flavoring agents then in the fertilizer industry urea and which is used in fertilizers the ninth industry where these organic compounds are used are textile industries where they are used in the form of nylon fibers, terylene fibers, natural and synthetic fibers. In the soap industries, 
where we have the soap products and this way organic chemistry is the study of hydrocarbons and their derivatives organic compounds are numerous in number because of the following properties because they involve carbon and carbon possesses the property of catenation so they have high catenation ability secondly higher cc bond dissociation energy and therefore these organic compounds formed are very strong and stable and very high energy is required to break the bonds between the carbon atoms in these organic compounds thirdly carbon possesses this property of tetravalency that is it can be bound to four other atoms which could be carbon atoms or any other element and that provides a variety of organic compounds to exist these organic compounds are capable of exhibiting isomerism we will be talking very shortly about isomerism in the upcoming lectures and carbon exhibits bond multiplicity it is capable of forming single double and triple bonds the ability of carbon atom to form long chains or rings is what we term as catenation the element with highest catenation ability is carbon because it has got tetravalency property as well the ability of carbon atom to form four bonds is called tetravalency to exhibit tetravalency carbon forms all four single bonds or two double bonds one double or two single bonds one triple one single bond any of these combination ground state electronic configuration of carbon we know is 1s2 2s2 2p2 and the excited state electronic configuration of carbon would be 1s2 2s1 2p1 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 now here one of the electron from the 2s orbital is going to jump into the 2px or 2py or 2pz any of the orbitals that would not be containing an electron for excitation energy that is required is 501.6 kilojoules per mole now in this table we will be talking about the hydrocarbon its hybridization the cc bond length in that compound ch bond length and shape and bond angle since we have already talked of chemical bonding and molecular structure chapter and we have seen how vscpr theory and vbt theories are actually able to predict the shape of the molecules so it should not be difficult for you to relate that to organic chemistry so let us look at the first hydrocarbon say alkane alkanes in alkanes carbon has sp3 hybridization cc bond length is approximately 1.54 picometers sorry angstrom 1.09 angstrom is the ch bond length and the shape is tetrahedral and we know that the tetrahedral bond angle is 109 degrees 28 minutes secondly this next hydrocarbon that we have is alkene where the hybridization of carbon is sp2 the bond length cc bond length is going to decrease to 1.34 angstrom the ch bond length is going to decrease to 1.08 angstrom and the shape or and the bond angle are trigonal planar and therefore 120 degree respectively the third hydrocarbon is alkene where the carbon has the hybridization sp bond length of carbon carbon bond further decreases to 1.20 angstrom and ch bond length is 1.06 angstrom with the shape being linear bond angle being 180 degrees now let us talk about sigma and pi bonds sigma bond is formed by the linear overlap of atomic orbital so it is n to n or head on overlap that results in the formation of sigma bond 
So linear overlapping of atomic orbitals or hybrid orbitals results in the formation of sigma bond. Whereas pi bond is formed by lateral overlap of pure atomic orbitals. So this is how a lateral overlap takes place. Now, what are types of carbon and hydrogen? Primary carbon, that is one degree carbon, is the one that is bonded to another carbon. Primary hydrogen is the hydrogen that is attached to the primary carbon. So, if we have one carbon atom, this is one carbon atom. When it is bonded to another carbon atom, this one, previous one, will be called as primary carbon. The hydrogen that is attached to it is primary hydrogen. Secondary carbon is the one that is bonded to two other carbon atoms. And secondary hydrogen is the one that is attached to secondary carbon. Tertiary carbon or three degree carbon is the one that is attached to three other carbon atoms. And tertiary hydrogen is the one that is attached to tertiary carbon. Quaternary carbon or 4 degree carbon is the one that is attached to 4 other carbon atoms. And therefore, there will not exist any quaternary hydrogen because when the carbon is bonded to 4 other carbon atoms, there is no other valency left for hydrogen to be bonded to that carbon. Let us look at the structural representation of organic molecules. So, if I look at the complete structural formula, say, if we have two carbon atoms, each of, the, each of these bonded to each other and each of them bonded to one hydrogen, the other two valencies are going to be satisfied with, say, hydrogen atoms only. This is my molecule ethane. When I remove two hydrogens, Put a double bond instead, that is called ethene. When I remove two hydrogens again, one from each carbon forming a triple bond, that would be ethene. Now let us look at the condensed structural formula. Condensed structural formula is CH3CH3 for ethane, CH2 double bond CH2 for ethene. Similarly, CH triple bond CH for ethyne. If I want to look at the bond line formula, now this is not something, you know, that is going to be directly asked from you. This is something that you are required to know because in the question, you will be given these condensed structural formula or even the bond line formula. And then you will be asked to solve something else, to find out something else. So there, if you do not have this basic knowledge, you will not be able to understand the question itself. Finding an answer is something beyond your imagination there. Now, what is bond line formula? C4H10, for instance, that is butane. So if you see here, each line is going to represent a bond. The ends of each line is going to represent a carbon atom. So, if it is going in the zigzag manner here, this is one carbon atom, then a bond, another carbon atom, then a bond, another carbon atom, then a bond, and this is the fourth carbon atom. And if you have to satisfy the valency of each of these carbons, you will have one, two, three hydrogens here, one, two, Five hydrogens, one, two, seven hydrogens, one, two, three. So a total of ten hydrogen atoms. This is butane. This is going to be cyclobutane similarly. Now structural representation of organic molecules. So if I want to look at the 3D representation of organic molecules, there are various ways in which we can look at the 3D representation of organic molecules. The first one is the wedge and dash formula. This is a wedge. This is a dash. This is solid wedge. This is dashed wedge or you can simply call it wedge and dash. The second is Newman's projections. So when you are representing a molecule by Newman's projection, so this 
this dot is representing one carbon atom. This circle is representing a carbon atom behind this carbon atom. Okay, so this dot is one carbon atom, which is one, two, three valencies here. The fourth valency is here between this carbon atom, dot carbon atom, and this carbon atom at the back of this. And the back carbon atom has one, two, and three valencies satisfied in this space. So this is how you have the Newman projection. So if you carefully see, if or if I take all of these, one, two, three, four, five, six as hydrogens, so this molecule is going to be ethane molecule. This is all about an introduction to organic chemistry. We will be taking up more topics in organic chemistry from the next lecture onwards. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel for joining YouTube live classes for best NEET or JE coaching. You can also download the first online university mobile app for continuous learning through your smartphones. Keep learning with First Online University, a team of millions of learners and educators worldwide.